You've probably heard again and again that the S&P 500 is the gold standard when it comes to reliable investing returns. But is it really? The S&P 500 just grabs the 500 biggest companies. In the last year, 150 of these companies overperformed the average, while 350 underperformed. What if there was a way to hone in on the top performing companies? More importantly, are there ETFs out there that have a way of filtering out some of the underperformers and they just have a greater percentage of the top performers and just few less underperformers? I'm going to show you why a dividend growth investing strategy filters for high quality companies and how to evaluate the best ETFs. But before we dive in, let me first explain why dividend growth characteristics filter for great companies. If you want market returns, you can easily achieve this by buying every company in the market. If you want superior returns, then you have to find a way to invest in superior companies. There are three ways that you can filter out companies from the market to achieve greater returns. I love blueberries. Let me use blueberries as an example. The smaller blueberries are typically packed with more flavor. One way that I could ensure that I only eat the tastiest blueberries is I could pick them out one by one by hand. This is like picking stocks. You can evaluate companies based on qualitative metrics. You might really like their product. You might think they have really good customer service. You can analyze companies based on quantitative metrics. You can look at their financial statements, see if their revenues are growing compared to their expenses, how is their debts. This takes a lot of expertise and it takes a lot of time. I don't wanna spend a lot of time picking hundreds of companies. The second way that you can ensure that you only eat the tastiest blueberries is by paying somebody else to pick them for you. This is analogous to an actively managed fund. An actively managed fund employs a team of professionals that have the expertise, hopefully, to select companies that are of a higher quality. However, it's very hard to differentiate between an actively managed fund that got lucky one year versus an actively managed fund that is truly skilled. For instance, according to this article by Forbes, it found that over the course of one year, roughly 51% of actively managed funds underperformed the S&P 500. That's just barely worse than a coin toss. However, this gets much worse when you look at the performance over extended periods of time. Over five years, just 13.5% of actively managed funds were able to outperform the S&P 500, and it gets worse over 10 years, only 8.5%. On top of the fact that there's no guarantee, actively managed funds are expensive. You might see an expense ratio of around 1%. This means every $100 that you spend, you're gonna pay $1 in expenses every year. This doesn't sound like much, but over a long period of time, which if you're investing properly, you're investing for a long period of time, this will add up big time. For instance, if we have a 1% expense ratio and an investment of 50,000 over 20 years with an average annual return of 10%, you can expect to pay roughly 56,000 in fees. If you compare that to my target expense ratio on passively managed funds of 0.1%, you're only paying $6,000 in fees. That's a $50,000 difference. Which brings me to the third way that I can ensure that I only eat the tastiest blueberries. I can use a filter. This is analogous to an index fund or a passively managed fund. An index is just a set of criteria that companies must have in order to make the cut. The filter in this case that I'm gonna analyze is the dividend growth filter. Companies that consistently grow their dividend exhibit resilience and steady growth. Because passively managed funds use a simple filter, the process of picking companies can be largely automated. You don't require a team of professionals, so the expense ratio will be much lower. Typically, I shoot for an expense ratio of less than 0.1%. Unfortunately, there are so many dividend-oriented ETFs. How would you narrow down the list? Would you use another filter? That's exactly what I would do. I use three criteria to determine which ETFs are going to outperform the market. Let me show you what I mean. The first ETF that fails my criteria is SPYD, S&P 500 High Dividend ETF. A lot of people love this ETF because it has a particularly high dividend, about 4.5%. On Seeking Alpha, if I scroll down to the fund profile, I can see that SPYD seeks to track the performance of the S&P 500 High Dividend Index. Next, I can Google the criteria for the S&P 500 High Dividend Index and see what criteria it uses to pick companies to make it in its fund. This index simply ranks all of the companies in the S&P 500 by dividend yield, putting the highest dividend yield at the top and the smallest dividend yield at the bottom. Then it just picks the top 
80 dividend yield companies. Does this sound like a good way to filter for high quality companies to you? If you said no, you would be right. The first criteria that an index must have is quality. It must have a way of filtering for quality companies. In this case, it does the opposite. Companies with an overly high dividend yield are not good. This is typically because they already have a high dividend and then the share price drops, resulting in the dividend yield going up. Share price dropping is usually a bad sign for a company. And in a lot of cases, they will soon have to pause, cancel, or reduce their dividend. SPYD fails my criteria of having a quality filter. The next dividend growth ETF that I want to show you corrects the problem with SPYD in that it tracks a very high quality index. However, it still falls short on my second criteria. By the way, you'll see in this video that I like to use Seeking Alpha for all of my investing research. If you're interested in getting $50 off of a paid subscription, then you can use my link in the description below. It is an affiliate link, so using it will help the channel and I would really appreciate it. KNGS is the Dividend Monarchs ETF. On the summary tab, we can go down to the fund profile and see that this investment seeks to track the total return of the S&P Dividend Monarchs Index. After Googling the index, we can see the eligibility factors. For a company to be included in KNGS, it must have increased its total dividend every year for at least 50 consecutive years. Any company that's pulled this off is reliable and has had consistent growth. These are two qualities that you absolutely want to invest in when we're talking dividend growth. For a company not to pause, cancel, or reduce its dividend for 50 consecutive years shows that it's incredibly reliable. Not to mention there have been several market crashes during that time period. Most recently, we had the COVID-19 crash. Before that, we had the financial crisis of 2008. Before that, we had the dot-com bubble. If you rely on your portfolio to cover your expenses, then having strong performance during a market crash is incredibly important. Now, you might be asking, how many companies are there that have managed to grow their dividend every year for 50 consecutive years? That is a good question because the list is short. KNGS only has 36 companies in its portfolio. This is not good for my second criteria. Did you guess it? Diversity. It is incredibly important for your portfolio to be properly diversified. If your portfolio is not properly diversified, you could be overly exposed to one sector or one company. For instance, during the financial crisis, if you were overly invested in real estate, then your portfolio would have taken a huge hit. It is incredibly difficult to be properly diversified with just 36 companies. You want to be exposed evenly to as many sectors of the U.S. economy as possible and as many companies as possible. When we look at the sector breakdown of KNGS, we can see that Consumer staples makes up over a quarter and industrials makes up about a fifth. Between just two sectors, that's almost 50% of the total companies in your portfolio. Only four sectors make up 75% of the holdings, while all of the other sectors just make up 25%. The next dividend growth ETF that I want to show you not only corrects the problem of diversification, but also has a quality index that it tracks. However, it still fails on my third criteria. iShares Select Dividend ETF, ticker DVY, has a solid yield at 3.84%. On Seeking Alpha in the fund profile, we can see that it tracks the performance of the Dow Jones US Select Dividend ETF. If we Google this index, we can once again see the criteria. DVY has many more quality controls than the Dividend Monarchs Index. First, the dividend per share must be greater than the five-year average dividend per share. This means it should be roughly increasing over the last five years. Additionally, it must have a very strong five-year average dividend coverage ratio. This figure checks that a company's profits are high enough to safely cover its dividend. Next, it must have paid dividends in each of the previous five years. Finally, a company must have a non-negative trailing 12-month earnings per share. I don't know why they didn't just say positive instead of non-negative, but in any case, this just checks that a company has growing earnings. The next thing I want to verify is that DVY has more diversity of holdings than KNGX. If we go to the holdings tab on Seeking Alpha, DVY is currently invested in over 105 companies. This is three times more than the Dividend Monarchs. However, the sector exposure is still roughly the same. As you can see, utilities and financials together make up roughly 50% of the sector exposure. For better diversification, typically I like to see a more even spread on the holding breakdown. So DVY has a solid dividend yield. It has 
a good quality index that it tracks, and it has decent diversification. But where does it go wrong? Path performance does not guarantee future returns, but it is a really good metric. On Seeking Alpha, if we go to the charting tab, we can plot the total return over the last 10 years for both DVY and the S&P 500. As you can see, the S&P 500 returned nearly 160%, while DVY returned only 133%. The S&P 500 has 500 holdings, and it has very good diversification. If I'm going to invest in a dividend growth ETF whose goal is to invest more heavily in the top performers and find a way to filter out the bottom performers, then I need to see past performance that's going to reflect that. The final dividend growth ETF that I'm going to show you destroys the previous three in all three of my criteria. Real quick, my number one goal is to help you make more money and save more money. If you're finding this valuable, share this with somebody that you think would benefit from it really helps me and it really helps my channel grow. Thank you very much. This ETF is a solid dividend yield of over 2% and it tracks the Dividend Aristocrats ETF. The S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats Index only allows companies that have increased their dividend every year for 25 consecutive years. This isn't as strong as the 50 plus years from the Dividend Monarchs, but 25 years is still a lot. Companies in the Dividend Aristocrats still managed to survive the dot-com bubble, the financial crisis of 2008, and the COVID-19 crash of 2020. You might be asking, why is the Dividend Aristocrats better than the Dividend Monarchs? Well, it's a little bit easier to meet the criteria of 25 consecutive years. As a result, more companies can be invested. More companies means greater diversification. The holdings tab on Seeking Alpha shows that this ETF has a similar sector breakdown, but nearly double the number of holdings at 69. The final criteria to check on this ETF is the past performance. The charting tab on Seeking Alpha shows that the ProShares S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrats ETF, ticker NOBL, N-O-B-L, has outperformed the S&P 500 over the last 10 years, returning 167%, while the S&P 500 returns about 160. At this point, you must have noticed that Noble has many good qualities, but it comes at a high price. Its expense ratio is much higher than the average passively managed fund. If you're like me, then you still wouldn't be quite satisfied with this hefty fee. In fact, I refuse. So I spent 34 hours researching index fund criteria, holdings analysis, checking expense ratios, and analyzing past performance. As a result, I found three dividend growth ETFs that destroy the dividend aristocrats for less cost. And I'm sharing all about it right here. And I'll see you over there shortly. See you over there in a bit. See you then. I'll catch you next time. Catch you on the flip side.